Venom Mystere doing a NFL playoff preview. The backdrop of this is going to be me playing StarCraft 2. This is a 2v2 match. I am on the red team up here in the top left, Savagewood. This is me and as Zerg. My ally is Papa Nasty, and we are playing against a blue team. A Terran, Terran team of Sonic Blaster and a guy named Draconian. So let's jump right into the NFL playoffs. The first round, of course, has already occurred. So the first round is going to be Colts-Chiefs. That's the first game that's going to occur. Now, the Chiefs are widely regarded as a very powerful team. Many people view them as the favorite. They have Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes manning the ship. Patrick Mahomes, of course, is the presumptive MVP. He has aired it out game after game and has just been exceptionally good. The thing to watch out for in this game is Andy Reid being a playoff choker. Notoriously, Andy Reid has had trouble winning that big game, of course, in Philadelphia, which is where he's most famous for coaching. He had a game where he basically didn't manage the clock well at all, and they lost the Super Bowl because of it. Since then, Andy Reid has lost a plethora of games at home for no good reason in the playoffs. He will be favored going into the playoffs. It will look like the Chiefs have no right losing the game, and what do you know, they'll piss away the game and lose. And Patrick Mahomes is not really proven, and he's a guy that airs it out. So I think a lot of people are expecting that he could throw a few interceptions or maybe fumble it. Because whenever the Chiefs do lose, usually that is the common factor, is Mahomes turning it over. A lot of people sort of view the Chiefs as the best team in the AFC. And certainly for the majority of the regular season, they were. Kareem Hunt was suspended. They fell off a little bit near the end. They had some close games against bad teams. And Andrew Luck and the Colts look red hot. They trashed the Cowboys. They did very well at the end of the year. And they have been successful so far as far as the run-pass attack goes. Because Marlon Mack, this is a guy who not a lot of people gave credit to, but just is phenomenal. If he's healthy, he's going to perform. Andrew Luck has been healthy. And to me, Andrew Luck has always been very overrated. People act like this guy is the next Aaron Rodgers. People act like if only he could get healthy, he would be God tier. Now he's very good, but he's just so injury prone. He hasn't really had a full season in ages, but he's finally gotten his shoulder healthy. The general manager of the Colts has done a good job to help surround Andrew Luck with protection. And that's been night and day difference. That's been the difference between Andrew Luck getting hurt every year and being sort of this guy that people view as, oh, if only he could stay healthy, almost like a Kerry Wood or a Mark Pryor in baseball. Instead, he's sort of realized his potential. He's a very good quarterback. Now, is he God tier? Is he this legendary figure that the ESPN talking heads prop him up to be? No, but he's good. And between T.Y. Hilton, Marlon Mack, and Andrew Luck, the Colts are going to give the Chiefs hell. And it wouldn't surprise me to see Big Red Andy Reid choke away this game and the Chiefs lose by a couple points. Now, in theory, the Chiefs are the better team, and they should win the game. But sort of looking at it intellectually honestly, without Kareem Hunt... And without an experienced quarterback, I think the Chiefs are very likely to throw this game away. Now, if Andy Reid wasn't the coach, the notorious playoff choker, I would give the Chiefs the edge here for sure because I do think the Chiefs are the better team. But I do actually think that the Colts are going to upset the Chiefs. The Chiefs will choke, and Andy Reid will once again be considered a playoff joker. Now what I really don't expect to happen is a blowout for the Chiefs just to go ham on the Colts. I think if the Colts lose, it'll be a respectable game. Now what do I want? I want the Chiefs to win. I think that would be the most exciting thing. I remember watching an episode of The Herd with Colin Cowherd. And at the beginning of his NFL playoff segment, he literally said, 
we're going to be predicting what would be most interesting because that's what we're rooting for, what's most interesting. And I sort of thought to myself, like, that's not the point of previewing playoff matchups. That's not the point of journalism or listening to any sort of sports talk show. You're supposed to give an opinion and try to figure out what's going on, not sit there and figure out what would be the most interesting Oh, it would be it would be 42 to 38, and it would be a last second game, and it would be an upset. It's just like, who who gives a shit what you think would be most interesting? In other words, what would be the most shocking or surprising, or what do you think is going to draw the most ratings on Monday? They literally said that. They literally said, well, we want to have something interesting to talk about Monday. And I was sort of blown away that a sports talk show host could actually sit there and say, like, yeah, we don't have any interest in being honest or predicting anything accurately. Like, this is what we're just going to, we're just going to spend 45 minutes jerking ourselves off. And, like, even if everything that is the most predictable thing or all of the favorites win, even if those things happen, at least we got to sit there on Friday and jerk off the narratives that we pretended to have. And you know what? Even if we're right, then we can sit there and pretend that we predicted it. And that just sort of blew me away. Anyway, that's the Colin Cowherd show. He's not a legitimate journalist. They had to predict that uh, that thought who got her job because she is the sister of an old NFL player to make his show even worth watching. Remember, Kristen Leahy is an utterly worthless person. But now that I've spent about half the video talking about FS1's lack of talent, we can talk about Cowboys Rams. <coughs> To me, this matchup is interesting because a lot of people predicted the Cowboys to lose. I think in many regards, they should have lost. Jason Garrett <clears throat> is not a very good coach. And the Cowboys have struggled throughout the year. Remember, after the Tennessee Titans lost, everyone and their mother was saying the Dallas Cowboys needed to fire Jason Garrett. He was a bum. He was washed up. He wasn't creative. Now, am I saying those things aren't true? No. But what I'm saying is Jerry Jones sat down and said, look, Jason Garrett's my puppet. If I fire him, it's essentially like saying, I don't know how to do my job. I'm an incompetent. Because Jason Garrett just does what Jerry says. So remember, people, whenever you see the Cowboys struggle and you say to yourself, why don't they fire Jason Garrett? All he does is call screens. He's an idiot. You're not wrong, but Jason Garrett is merely a reflection of Jerry Jones. So whenever you consider the fact that Jerry Jones and Jason Garrett are sort of one and the same, that's the reason why Jason Garrett wasn't fired four years ago. So keeping that in mind, the Cowboys are looking to ground and pound with Zeke Elliott. Dak Prescott, merely a passable quarterback. A lot of people like Colin Cowherd. I know I keep talking about him. But I listened to his show, and I was just blown away by how little he had to say. And I always thought Colin Cowherd is sort of billed as this guy who is, oh, he's controversial. He'll say what other people won't say. He's creative. You know, he's not just a shill. Who's, you know, a lot of these ESPN guys, like, you know what Max Kellerman's going to say. You know what Stephen A is going to say. Ship and scan, ship, <laughs> Skip and Shannon is basically so pre-written that it's a soap opera and it's almost not even fun to watch. So whenever I watch Ka Colin Cowherd and he spent half of his show talking about what he thinks is, what he thinks would be most interesting as opposed to what he thinks will actually happen in real life, it was sort of boring. What do I think will actually happen in real life? Dak Prescott underperforms. The Cowboys defense is solid, but the offense just isn't able to score enough points. Zeke has a solid day, but in the end, I think Dak probably throws a bad interception and the Cowboys lose by about four points to the Rams. And it's a damn shame because there is a chance we could actually have Cowboys-Eagles in an NFC title game. Another interesting thing about this is the implications for the Cowboys-Rams game is throwing it back to that week in Tennessee, everyone was saying fire Garrett. And essentially the consensus was, is all it takes is one more crappy week for the Cowboys for Garrett to be out the door, even though he's Jerry's boy. And what do you know, Amari Cooper is traded for, everyone says that they gave too much, turns out it saved the season. 
and the Cowboys are sitting here saying, oh, well, it wasn't Jason Garrett, which, of course, is Jerry Jones sort of saying, oh, it wasn't my fault. Look at what I did. Not only was it not my fault coaching-wise, but I made the move to save the season. And good for him. You know, I'm glad the Cowboys saved their season. And it would be really interesting to see them win. And it would be funny to see the incredibly dick road Sean McVay just get absolutely shut down. Now, I think it's worth noting that so many people out of, you hear this phrase all the time on mainstream sports networks, Sean McVay's coaching tree. What does that really mean? It just means people that worked with and around Sean McVay. These are highly touted guys who usually are white and have a pension for this sort of gimmicky, flashy offensive style. Now, why would I bring up them being white? Because I'm starting to hear this rumor, and when I say rumor, it's really more of a narrative. But I'm starting to hear this thing increasingly on sports talk shows where as black coaches are being fired one after the other because they've done a terrible job and their teams have sunk regardless of position, people are starting to say, oh, well, even though the Rooney rule is in place, which is an affirmative action rule saying that even if you know exactly who you want as your coach, you have to you have to interview a black guy, even if you know that you have no interest in him, even if you have your heart set on this guy or... Maybe you have three different candidates you're really considering. You have to interview a token black candidate. And we're going to hop into another replay here as we haven't even previewed the other matchups. It's just sort of interesting to think that the league is going to sit there and portray these things. And the journalists are going to sit here and say these things. And... Oh, Sean McVay, he's a god because he can send people in motion. And we see here double zerg down here in the bottom right. This is me, Savagewood. People act like Sean McVay walks on water because the motherfucker sends people in motion. And when you watch a Sean McVay game versus a Jason Garrett game, you sort of sit there and think to yourself, well, shit, maybe Sean McVay is a god because Jason Garrett has been doing the same shit for nine years. Screen pass. Slant over the middle. Conservative quarterback draw. Conservative punt on fourth and two. Uncreative run up the middle. I mean, Jason Garrett really plays a sort of archaic style. And when people watch that garbage and they see talent like Zeke Elliott being wasted... They say to themselves, well, look at Sean McVay. He's literally faking a, an end around or a reverse in 50% of his plays. That is so much for a defense to account for, and it's so hard to prepare for. And in many regards, that's true. But as the Rams sort of run into injuries and fall off near the end of the year, everyone has sort of retreated on this Sean McVay as a god narrative. And as teams fire their coaches for Sean McVay cronies, before the Rams even play a playoff game, mind you, it's going to be interesting to see what if the Rams somehow get upset by the Cowboys in the first round. Now, I live in Texas, and I like the Cowboys. I'm not necessarily a Cowboys first fan, but it's worth noting that ever since the Cowboys have played Seattle, there has been this significant narrative that has gone on, that the Cowboys are done, they're washed up, and they need to get rid of Jason Garrett. Now, obviously, they've gotten Amari Cooper and things have changed a little, but whenever they played the Saints, that was a watershed, season-turning moment. And when they beat the Saints, it was such a big deal. And I'll tell you why it's a big deal, because it guaranteed Jason Garrett job security until the end of the year. And you know what? Beating the Seahawks guaranteed Jason Garrett job security Excuse me for next year. This is all very interesting if you care about the Dallas Cowboys because this means that one the outcome of one game affects how the team is going to be run for the next year. Now, if the Cowboys actually beat the Rams and go to the NFC Championship, it's going to be Jason Garrett for a hot minute. So this thing is very impactful, this game. You know, you might say, well, the Cowboys are never going to win a Super Bowl. 
And you know, I think you would probably be right about that. The Cowboys have a very low percent chance of actually winning the entire thing. But if you're a Cowboy fan, you should be concerned about this. You should be concerned about the fact that, okay, if we beat the Rams and get the shit kicked out of us by the Saints in the NFC title game, well, hell, we still went to the NFC title game when it looked like we weren't going to make the playoffs. That means Jason Garrett's going to stay. The status quo is going to stay the same. More screen passes, more clapping, more Dak Prescott, more 9-7, and seven, more absolute best you can do is 11 wins, and that's if you have the best or second best defense in the NFL. And you sort of get to this point as a Cowboy fan where you think to yourself, is it worth winning? Obviously, we want to win. And I'm of the opinion that tanking and losing on purpose is sort of corny and uninteresting. So I'm not advocating tanking. But what I am saying is that if you look at the Cowboys now, I don't think it's unfair to say they've overachieved. And they have done a very good job recovering what looked like a lost season. So when you sit here and think to yourself, if they beat the Rams, it's going to be an oh shit moment and Jerry Jones and Jason Garrett are going to pat themselves on the back and say, oh look how great we are, we did a great job. And it's going to have a ripple effect on the Dallas Cowboys. Now as far as the Rams go, honestly I think the expectations are still sort of like, oh we're a transitioning young exciting franchise. But I think if you're the Rams, after last year's disappointing playoffs, you have to win at least one round. You know, if you win one round and lose a shootout to the Saints, it's okay, you know. That's not that big of a deal. But if you lose in the first round to Dak Prescott and a team that looked like it was dead in the water, as a Rams fan and as the Rams organization, you've got to be sitting there and thinking, you've got to be sitting there thinking to yourself, like, what the hell did we do wrong? Is Sean McVay overrated? Like, we have one of the most high-dollar, overpaid defenses in the league with tons of exciting names that really performed well during most of the regular season. We have this quote-unquote offensive guru who we got 50 people waiting in a line to suck off, and if he's busy, then they're going to just be willing to suck off any of the people that was in his coaching tree. Like, that's how popular Sean McVay is. And if freaking Jason Garrett and Jerry Jones, probably the one, the two of the most laughed at and reviled people in the mainstream media of the American press, as far as Stephen A., Max Kellerman, almost everyone, even people who like the Cowboys, like Skip Bayless, every, and even your average Cowboy fan, people hate these two guys, and there's no denying it. Jason Garrett and Jerry Jones, even if you bleed cowboy blue, these people are hated by a large portion of the fan base, and they're hated by a large majority of the American population. And to sit here and consider that, okay, the Cowboys probably aren't going to make the playoffs, to think that they're going to have to run through either the Saints and Rams or the Rams and Eagles, that's very unlikely and then god forbid they like beat the patriots somehow in the super bowl that would just that would be blow your doors off incredible for a cowboy fan but it would just be incredibly improbable to beat those three juggernaut teams so i think if you're a cowboy fan what you're really looking at here is saying to yourself okay well what we're probably not going to win at all so what are the implications of stealing a game from the rams and I think for this week's playoff matchup, this has got to be the most interesting matchup because if the Rams lose, it's just terrific. And if the, the Cowboys lose, it's sort of expected. But if the Cowboys upset, it's going to be big and it's going to have long-lasting impact on the NFL. Because let, let's just, to wrap up this game, if the Cowboys win, the new narrative you're going to hear is that the, the infamous Sean McVay coaching tree that everyone and their dog has been sucking off for weeks and weeks and weeks, you're going to be hearing the narrative that they're actually overrated and that Sean McVay is not actually good. So that'll be fun. Because there's never actually any continuity with the sports media. There was never like, oh yeah, we were wrong about Sean McVay. It's just sort of like that gets memory hold and then they just say like, oh, I guess Sean McVay is overrated and all these NFL teams are dumb racist for hiring white people instead of black people for their 
for their coach, and we need to uh, double down on the Rooney rule. You might be think you might be thinking I'm being absurd, but these are actual narratives that I've I've heard on sports radio that oh well, the, why are these white guys getting jobs, and the Rams look sort of shaky, and we need to be careful because it looks like the Rooney rule might be undermined. There's not a single sports journalist that's saying almost every single black coach has absolutely failed and cost their team and city to suffer. Maybe we need to re-question the Rooney rule because we can pretty much come to the conclusion that no team is going to sit there and not hot, not interview. Not, and remember, it's interview, not hire. Almost no one's going to sit there and not even interview a, a qualified black coach just because he's black. Like, it's 2019. Many of the players are black. N- none of the owners are going to be doing that if it can get them wins. It's just ridiculous. So we got Chargers Pats. I really don't want to spend too much time on this because I think this is going to be a one-sided beat down by the Patriots. This is just going to be another flaccid Philip Rivers Chargers choke job. I think that much of the mainstream media and the ESPN talking heads they're just chomping at the bit to see Brady and Belichick go down. For the last three years, these bozos have been saying, this is the year, this is the year it's the end of an era, this is the year where Brady and Belichick are finally, and it's, they're always wrong. And I look at the Chargers' schedule and say to myself, they didn't do much this year, they barely beat the Chiefs, that's about it, I'm not really that impressed by what they've done elsewhere. The Pats are always a team that show up at home and in the playoffs. What do you know? They're at home and in the playoffs. And the Chargers are always a team that choke in the playoffs. Give me the Pats. It doesn't matter if Josh Gordon is out. Give me the Pats. Eagles Saints. This is another matchup that I would think will be relatively one-sided. But this is another matchup like the Cowboys game that will have extremely far-reaching consequences on the backdrop and foundation of the team if the underdog wins so if the Eagles win with Nick Foles in many ways similar to the Jason Garrett situation it will sort of be saying like okay well this this really means something just because we got this far in the playoffs it means we need to make a significant decision and in the Cowboys case it means oh Jason Garrett was actually great the whole time In Philly's case, it means that Nick Foles is actually great the whole time. Carson Wentz was an extremely high-drafted, highly-touted guy who everyone liked and had an MVP tier season going right up until the end of the year when he hurt his leg and was in a situation where there was no way in hell he was going to be able to come back for the playoffs. And Nick Foles led them to the Super Bowl and won them the Super Bowl. And the Eagles were sort of eating shit for the majority of the year. Nick Foles came in again after, what do you know, Wincy got hurt once again. And Nick Foles led him to the playoffs, led him to the second round of the playoffs. And I think a lot of Eagle fans are sort of saying, like, why the hell don't we just keep Nick Foles? Every time we have rolled with Wince since he got hurt, we've done poorly. So what's up with that? Like, let's just roll with Foles. Philly fans are these sort of what-have-you-done-for-me-lately type fans. And I'm not saying they're wrong in their belief, but the ownership of the Eagles is definitely saying, oh, we're, we're committed to Wentz at the moment. And I'm not saying that Wentz is bad, but it's interesting because if Foles, God forbid he leads them to another Super Bowl, win or lose, how are you going to sit there and say, like, yeah, you've led us to two straight Super Bowls, and both of them have been in seasons where you've had to come in at the end of the year and just get shit done. But yeah, screw that. We're gonna we're going with Wincy. Honestly, the Eagles might be better off paying Foles and letting you know trading Wincy. But as far as the Saints go, they're an extremely powerful offensive team. They've looked really shitty at the end of the year. The Cowboy game was especially awful. But with Sean Payton and Drew Brees, you've got to think they're going to get at least 24 points this game. This will be a very exciting game. And again, I think it's worth pointing out that 
the most exciting element of this game will be if the Eagles win because not only will it impact their quarterback situation, but God forbid if the Eagles and Cowboys both win double upset, you're just going to have an absolutely bananas situation, but I don't think that'll happen. I think it'll be Pats, Saints, Rams, Colts. But if I, if I was uh, calling Cowherd and I was going to spend 45 minutes on what would be most fun, it would be Chiefs, Pats, Cowboys, Eagles, and then give me the Eagles and, no, it'll be Eagles, Cowboys in the Super Bowl, or in the uh, NFC title game, excuse me. Give me Cowboys, Pats in the Super Bowl for most exciting, most realistic, give me Pats, Saints, and I'll take the Pats again. It's been Venomous Stare, I'm out. Sub for more.